There are more than 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's today. That number is expected to rise to nearly 13 million by 2050, and they're not alone. Those that love them are also carrying a heavy responsibility. Last year, caregivers provided about 15 billion hours of care, valued at a staggering 257 billion. Thank you for joining us, The Confident Patient in a New World. I'm Beth Myers, founder of 2x2 Health and co-author of The Confident Patient, and I'm joined by my colleague and co-author, Wendy Benson. With us today is Danielle Ahrens, nurse practitioner specializing in memory disorders, Alzheimer's and dementia. With June being Alzheimer's Awareness Month, this couldn't be more relevant time for us to talk about such an important topic. Thank you for joining us, Danielle. Wendy, we have a lot of questions for Danielle, so I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Beth. And Danielle, we're so pleased to have you today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Let's start off with your specialty as a nurse practitioner who really focuses on um, people who are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. How do you interact with other medical professionals on the team? So I am a, I'm a nurse practitioner. My training is in geriatrics. So that means I have a training in caring for older adults. And then I specialize in the care of people with dementia Alzheimer's or other memory disorders. And in that role, I interact a lot with primary care physicians and providers, other nurse practitioners, psychiatry and neurology. You know, this, this is such an area of wide prevalence. You know, I, we all know someone and families who are dealing with this. When is an ideal time for a patient um, or, and or their family members to reach out to someone like you? Well, you know, families reach out at a lot of different points, um, you know, and every case is a little bit different and memory loss looks different for every person who experiences it. Um, so for some individuals, it's reaching out very early when memory problems have just beginning and are mild, such as forgetting words, forgetting appointments, maybe um, just a mild memory trouble and patients and families reach out for additional support to hopefully find a plan that's gonna maximize their function as long as possible. Other families reach out to me when things are a little more advanced and there's changes with mood and behavior and uh, more significant memory loss. So. In a perfect world, uh, Danielle, when would be like the ideal time a family contacts you? Like you're like, oh, this is my bread and butter. I'm so happy you called at this point. When, when would that be? <laughs> That's a tough one to answer, Beth, because um, I feel like I feel like this disease is such a long process and there's so many opportunities to help. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, it's early because then we can prevent crises and we can work together to come up with a care plan that is comprehensive, looks at the big picture and make sure that we're trying to ensure this individual is leading the life that they want to live, the quality of life they want to have uh, with this with the illness. Yeah, quality of life is so important. Is so you know, I think oftentimes when we think about um, memory disorders and challenges, we think of an older population. Tell us a little bit more about um, if it does affect younger people and, you know, kind of what to think through in those processes. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And actually about five or 6% of people with Alzheimer's disease are under the age of 65. And for many of those individuals, the symptoms begin in their 50s and for some even in their 40s. So. Uh, young people are not immune to getting Alzheimer's disease. It's not as common, um, but it certainly can happen. And when it does, it's referred to as young onset Alzheimer's disease or early onset Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. And Beth mentioned in the introduction that by 2030, um, the amount of people dealing with Alzheimer's disease will double. Uh, what is that attributed to? Yeah, that, that um, number is pretty staggering. And you know, currently about 6 million people have Alzheimer's and maybe by 2050, it's estimated about 12.7 million people will have this mm. disease. I think there's a variety of factors working. One of them being that we are aging, we're living longer and we're living longer, a little healthier. We're better at handling things like heart disease and other chronic illnesses. And so as a, as a population, we're living longer and age is the greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, the other big component to that is simply that our population is aging and the more older Americans there are, the more cases there will be of Alzheimer's disease. So 
the baby boomers are now starting to turn 65. So that means that the population is aging and you know, I think it's estimated that by about 2030, 20% of our population will be over 65 years old. And so we have a lot more older adults who are gonna be vulnerable to dementia. And that's staggering. Yeah. With, um, with more and more vaccines being available, with people um, being able to see their family now more than they were months ago or a year ago, um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, when families are being reunited, maybe seeing some differences, some significant differences from a year ago. Um, what, should, what should people be looking for? What are some signs that would trigger um, some action on a family member's part if they're noticing some things are different with their family member? Sure. So yeah, COVID has really impacted a lot of people and um, that social isolation has it's taken its toll and it's taken its toll on a lot of older adults and exacerbated memory problems for some. And the things that families would want to look for are short-term memory loss. So repeating stories or questions, uh, perhaps calling multiple times or calling to tell them the same thing more than once and um, trouble with managing bills or balancing a checkbook when maybe that was something they could do very easily, maybe a little more trouble with that now and uh, misplacing things. Other early signs would be changes in language. So coming up with a word, the words on the tip of the tongue or rather than saying a word, talking around the word to describe something rather than using the word that describes something is, is a common language uh, change that happens with Alzheimer's disease. And um, another reason why a lot of families call is that they just know that the person should no longer be driving. And they may not be able to articulate exactly why. Perhaps maybe there hasn't been an accident or a ticket, but there's enough evidence that they feel the person shouldn't be driving. And Usually that's something, you know, you should listen to your gut and, and really seek help if you feel that may be the case, because there could be some underlying memory trouble that's making you feel like perhaps this person isn't safe to drive any longer. So those would be some things to, to look for. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I, at this point, I feel like I want to ask a question that's uplifting <laughs> about now, <laughs> now that we have all of these things that we're faced with for ourselves and for our loved ones. What are some things that we can do to preserve, you know, our brain health and the proactive things that we can do to try as stay as healthy as possible, not only for ourselves, but our loved ones? Yeah. You know, the good news is there are things we can do. So we can't, we can't change our genetics. We can't change that. Um, but we can certainly do everything we can to keep ourselves healthy. And, you know, Brain health, the way I like to talk to families about it is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And a lot of us already know what's good for our heart. So um, the brain uses about 20% of our oxygen and energy. Um, so we have to fuel the brain with good oxygenated blood. We've got to keep our heart healthy and we have to keep our vessels healthy. Um, and we can do that by controlling things like high blood pressure, controlling diabetes and um, controlling high cholesterol, all those things are going to help with brain health as well. Um, exercise is extremely important and many studies have shown that individuals who exercise are at a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and if they do develop the disease it tends to progress more slowly or maybe they develop it at an older age. Um, they maybe would have had symptoms when, if they were younger if they hadn't been someone who exercised regularly. So that's really important. And um, keeping your brain healthy and active. So doing things that maybe you don't normally do, doing things that are challenging for yourself. Never too old to take a class or learn a new hobby. Or if you like crosswords, try doing word searches or Sudokus instead and, and vice versa. Doing things to kind of stimulate your brain. Um, the other important part is social networks. People who have good social connections tend to do better. And uh, that was really difficult during the pandemic because mm -hmm. so many people had to isolate. So now that things are lifting, it's gonna be super important to build those social networks back up and get out and get moving and, and be with friends and be with people that can really benefit. Um, and then treating things that we know how to treat. Depression can cause changes in memory and anxiety can. So making sure if you're feeling any of those things, you're seeking help and, um, and you're getting treated for any kind of emotional problems that you're having because that will in turn 
help your memory as well. It's also multifaceted and connected, isn't it? I, I just when you talked about what's what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And when you talked about the oxygen, I immediately tried to sit up straighter and take a deep breath. <laughs> and do we need another reason to exercise? You know, like, I mean, all of those things. And there's been a lot of press over the last several years about really, you know, doing your brain exercises too, right? Like with, uh, with various puzzles and learning something new and, you know, trying a language or learning a musical instrument. It's, it's really, um, those are the upsides, right? Those are the things to really focus on in terms of keeping ourselves healthy. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, when I think about um, close family members and, and friends whose family members are going through this, they're, you know, very commonly people are feeling frustrated, concerned, overwhelmed, helpless. But I do know that they also experience, you know, moments of joy and, um, and, and these bright spots that can occur. Obviously, in, in your line of work, you've dealt a lot with that. Can you share a little bit about some of the moments of joy that you've experienced with some of your patients and their family members? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, of all, the, all the time I've worked with hundreds of families and I've gained so much um, from just interacting with them. And every single case is different and every situation is different. But I would say that overall, I feel like the families who are able to, at some point, um, find humor and be able to laugh together, uh, really, it can really help manage some of the stress because it is, it's a horrible disease and there's a lot of difficult times and difficult moments, uh, but there are also some funny ones. And if you can find some time to laugh during those times, it can really help ease the burden of some of the, some of the other stressful times. Um, I'm trying to think, it's, it's hard to think of a particular example of humor because every situation is so different. Um, but I think really laughing together can really make a big difference. And, and my takeaway certainly has also been that this disease may take away memory and it may change someone's ability to plan or look ahead, but it doesn't take away that capacity to live in the moment. And um, I think as human beings, we have this incredible ability to love and to find joy really in the moment with someone else. And I think that's what, what sort of brings me inspiration and what keeps me going is working with families and, and finding those times to have those connections because you can still have them even if you have this disease. So. You really need to be mindful about it. You yeah. know, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your life's work with us, Danielle. If you'd like to learn more about caring for patients with memory disorders and the work Danielle is doing, you can visit www adcareexperts.com or email her at danielle at adcareexperts.com or give her a call at the number listed below. In the meantime, Wendy and I will continue our conversations with medical experts and healthcare professionals as we help the confident patient in the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Danielle. And from all of us at 2 by 2 Health, we wish you great confidence and health. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye.